I want to invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 11 as we continue to be inspired this summer by the great heroes of faith described in this famous chapter. And let's keep in mind what Don Westblade said back on June 28th when he filled the pulpit, that the real hero of this chapter is God himself. Because remember, God is the object of our faith. He is the one in whom we trust. And as we will see today, authentic faith in our faithful God will always drive believers to action. You see, authentic faith is not passive. Authentic faith is active. And faith in our God fuels action. So just listen along. Follow as I read Hebrews chapter 11, verses 8 through 12, which describes the active faith of Abraham and Sarah. God's word says, by faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive even when she was past the age, since she considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man, and him as good as dead were born descendants as many as the stars of heaven and as many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. May God bless the reading and the preaching of his word this morning. As we look at the active faith of Abraham and Sarah, I want us to see three things this morning. How faith fuels Activity in the life of the believer. The first one I want to point you to in verse 8 is that faith fuels obedience to God's commands. Faith fuels obedience to God's commands. See it there in verse 8. By faith, Abraham obeyed. Now, to, in order to really understand and appreciate the faith-motivated obedience of Abraham, we need to think back about Genesis chapters 11 and 12. Because before Abraham was Abraham, he was Abram, the son of Terah. And Abram grew up in the moon-worshipping culture of Mesopotamia, in a region known as Ur of the Chaldeans. And that means, as far as we know, Abram knew nothing of the one true God, Yahweh. That is, until Yahweh spoke to Abram. Listen, you don't have to turn there, but listen to Genesis 12, 1 through 5, which records that first communication from Yahweh to Abram. It says, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go! from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went. As the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran 
And Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered, and the people that they had acquired in Haran, and they set out to go to the land of Canaan. You see, the command of God was clear to Abram. Go. Go from your country, your kindred, your father's house, to the land of that I will show you. You see, the command was clear, but it was filled with all sorts of unknowns, right? He was going to go to an unknown people, called to leave his own family at age 75 and to move to a foreign culture, a culture with whom he had probably had no interaction, moving into a place where he would be the minority. And he was called to go to an unknown place. At the outset, he's commanded by Yahweh with nothing more than go to the place I will show you. It's a lot of unknown, right? It took faith for Abraham to obey the command of Yahweh to go out into the unknown. Now, most of you have probably made a move a time or two in your lifetime, right? Any move, whether across the country or just across town, comes with lots of unknowns. But in this day and age, we can really minimize the unknowns, can't we? In this day and age, those unknowns can be minimized because we have Google Earth, and we've got Zillow. We have realtors and websites. We can walk through houses without ever signing a mortgage. We can hop on a plane and take a look at a job and an employer out of state without signing a contract first. We can minimize the unknowns. But that's not how it was for Abram. All he had was the crystal clear command of God to go. And that was enough for Abram, the father of faith. He went out by faith, not by sight, not by research or reconnaissance. He went out by faith. And Abraham confidently obeyed the command of God, and he stepped out into the unknown. And friends, that's what authentic faith does. It steps out into the unknown. Faith fuels obedience to God's commands, even when God commands us to go to difficult places or do difficult things. Now, you ought not expect to hear the audible voice of God commanding you to, to move to a different country or across the street, because that's not how God communicates to us today. He's given us something better. He speaks to us day by day. As I've said time and time again, and as I will say time and time again, God speaks to us in His living and active Word, the Bible. Are we listening? He's speaking to us day by day. And when God speaks in His Word, even when He speaks commands to His new covenant Christian people, he expects us to obey by faith. The commands of God in Scripture, friends, will sometimes force you out into the unknown. Maybe I should say they will oftentimes force you out into the unknown. Will you obey Him by faith? Think about a couple classic examples of God's commands to His people in the New Testament. God says, forgive those who have sinned against you, even when their response is unknown. Will you obey God by faith and forgive that spouse or that sibling, even if they don't respond with a humble apology? That's trusting God and obeying by faith. God says to love not just your family or your church friends or your, your neighbors. God says to love your enemies, which might put you at 
greater risk or some sort of unknown vulnerability. But the command is to love, to love your enemies. So will you obey God by faith and show love to that quarrelsome neighbor or to that belligerent coworker or to that playground bully? Will you obey God by faith and love your political rival enough to pray for her or him? Will you obey God by faith and love radical Muslims enough to pray for their conversion and to give generously to global missions to reach all the unreached with the gospel of Jesus Christ? You see, faith fuels obedience to the commands of God. And so the next time when you hear a biblical command, don't chafe at that. See it as an opportunity to trust God as you step out into the unknown. Secondly, in verses 9 and 10, we see that faith fuels living for God's city. Faith fuels living for God's city. Now to be sure, we just heard Abraham was promised a land, a place. And what's interesting about Abraham is that he never settled permanently in any one place in the land of Canaan. Technically, he never owned property in Canaan until he purchased a burial plot for his wife, Sarah from Ephron the Hittite, as recorded in Genesis 23. You see, Abram, he was a, a nomad. And his son, Isaac, and his grandson, Jacob, they were nomads too, just like their father. They moved about the land of Canaan with their flocks and their herds from one seasonal pasture to another, from watering holes to wells. They lived as foreigners among the Canaanites. They lived as foreigners among a pagan culture, even as they had found new faith in the one true God. We could say that they were resident aliens, sojourners. And verse 9 says something interesting about their life, how they lived. It says they were living in tents. Now, I know, a good number of you College Baptist folks, you like to camp. You really like to camp and get out into God's creation, and you like to live in tents, right? Well, it's interesting. Tent camping is transitory, right? You can move from one campground to the next with ease. You can wander from place to place to place. You aren't tied down to one location like some of those wimps who stay in hotels, right? This is exciting. This is refreshing to be out living in tents. That is until a rainstorm comes and there's a river running through your tent. Or until you pitch your tent on an ant colony like I did one time on a hiking trip up north. That didn't turn out well. You're living in those tents and you're liking it until you just need that air conditioning or that hot shower or you just want to get away from the spiders or the mosquitoes. And at some point in your tent camping adventures, you kind of long for your house. You know that permanent dwelling place, the one with the foundation and the roof and the four walls, that place of safety and security, that place that you can call home. I've noticed all you avid tent campers, you, you always come home sooner or later. So why did Abraham, why did he live in tents even though he had entered the land promised to him by God? I mean, why didn't he settle down and become an established farmer instead of a, a nomadic shepherd? Why did he live in tents when he could have built a house? Well, verse 10 answers that question. 
He did this because he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. The writer to the Hebrews here tells us that Abraham lived in tents in the promised land of Canaan because he knew that Canaan was not his ultimate home. He knew that God, the chief architect, the master craftsman, had built a city with permanent foundations. And the writer to the Hebrews says about Abraham, Abraham's eyes were set. They were set on that eternal city, not on this temporal world. Once we get to Hebrews 12, 22, we'll see that God's city is described in this way. The city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. And don't be worried, those of you like uh, rural lifestyle, that city of God, that heavenly Jerusalem is described in Revelation as a garden city where fruit is always in season, and there are trees lining the golden streets. You see, faith fuels living for God's eternal city rather than being consumed with our man-made earthly homes. And Abraham is this excellent example of this faith-fueled eternal mindset. Now, don't misunderstand Abraham's example is not an explicit command for you all to, to give up your home and live in tents. You don't need to feel guilty because you own a home. But we also must not dismiss the example of Abraham's eternal mindset. Because he lived intentionally as a pilgrim. Bible scholar William Lane puts it this way, living in tents is the sign that believers, and by this I think he means all believers, are pilgrims and strangers whose goal is yet before them. As people of faith, have we embraced our identity as pilgrims in this world, as resident aliens? Remember the Apostle Peter calls Christians sojourners and exiles in the second chapter of his first letter. Or as the old gospel hymn puts it, this world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world forever. Let's be honest, friends. Our society is crumbling in so many ways. And that is really disconcerting to many of us on a number of levels, isn't it? And I think it's truly lamentable that the, the authentic faith of some of our Christian forefathers is being neglected in the public square of our nation. And so I think we should be praying and voting for those who will govern our nation and that they would do it with wisdom and virtue that would please God to whom this whole world belongs. But as our society becomes increasingly secular, perhaps we should remember that this world is not our home. That God has not specifically promised us the American dream. That we too, like most Christians throughout history, are living in tents. We're resident aliens in a hostile world. But because of that, we live by faith as we look to God's eternal city. You know, when you do go camping in tents, you intentionally divest yourself of certain creature comforts and privileges. You might go without a shower. You might eat more meager meals. You can vacation in a tent on a fraction of the funds that it would cost to stay at a five-star resort. So camping in tents means living strategically and simply. The Christian life is meant to be lived in tents. 
by faith looking forward to and living for God's city. And I want to commend you, College Baptist, because I see you living in this way. Even in the midst of a global pandemic, when there's lots of financial insecurity, you have given faithfully to the work of ministry at College Baptist. You look on the back of the bulletin, we are ahead of budget in the middle of summer. That is an example of your faith, your eternal mindset. And I would just challenge all of us to consider ways that we can continually simplify and live more strategically and be even more generous to the opportunities before us, eternal opportunities, especially giving above and beyond to global missions or mercy ministries or just being kind and generous to your neighbor next door. We must take seriously both the command and the promise of Jesus in Matthew chapter 6, where he said, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where is your treasure? Living in tents means intentionally divesting yourself now in order to store up eternal treasure in heaven, which you can enjoy for all eternity. After all, the things that we own here on earth don't really belong to us in the first place. You might have heard the story about the great British evangelist, John Wesley. One day, when John was away from home, someone came running to him saying, your house is burned down. Your house is burned down. And Wesley replied, no it hasn't. Because I don't own a house. The one I have been living in belongs to the Lord. And is, if it is burned down, that's one less responsibility for me to worry about. I don't know about you, but that is a rebuke to me. Because I hold tightly to earthly things. But he's right. This world is not our home. The things that we have, we're just stewards over those things for the time being. So whether the example of Wesley or the example of Abraham here in the Spirit-inspired Word, I hope that we see that both of those examples teach us that faith fuels living as sojourners temporarily and living for God's city eternally. And thirdly, looking at verses 11 and 12, we see that faith fuels trust in God's promises. Faith fuels trust in God's promises. As you probably know, God had promised Sarah, Abraham's wife, a baby. And do you remember Sarah's initial response to God's promise of a baby? Genesis chapter 18, verse 12 says that Sarah laughed to herself, saying, I am worn out. And my Lord, that is her husband Abraham, is old. And you can hardly blame Sarah for laughing. At the time of this promise, Sarah was 90 years old. She was well past the age of childbearing, and she had been bearing her entire married life. She probably laughed so she didn't cry, right? And Abraham, he was 99 going on 100. Worn out, to put it nicely. Don't you see, this was an impossible promise. And I think you would have laughed too if you heard those words of the Lord. But evidently, something changed for Sarah at some point in time. Because here in Hebrews 11, verse 11, we hear that by faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive even when she was past the age, since she considered 
him faithful who had promised. It's important to read that entire sentence. You see, Sarah didn't get pregnant simply because she believed she could get pregnant. I want to get pregnant. I want to get pregnant. I'm going to be pregnant. It's not how faith works. No, she conceived a baby by faith in the one who had promised the baby, namely God himself, who she rightly considered to be faithful and trustworthy. She clung to a promise that was seemingly impossible because the one who made the promise was faithful. She clung to, trusted the rock-solid promises of God. And at some point, after that initial laugh of disbelief, Sarah believed the impossible promise of God, and that faith led to the birth of miracle baby Isaac, whose name means he laughs. And then in Genesis 21, Sarah says this, after the birth of Isaac, God has made laughter for me. Joyous laughter. A baby at age 90. And the joyous laughter, it didn't stop with Isaac. As a result of the faith of barren Sarah and as good as dead Abraham, verse 12 tells us that God graciously delivered on his promise to give them not just a son, but descendants. Descendants as many as the stars of heaven and as many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. Earlier this spring, my son Jonah and I took a late night drive out into the countryside to do an astronomy assignment for Mrs. Roberts. And you know, on a dark night in rural Hillsdale County, you could see a lot of stars. Too many to count, for sure. Had the privilege of traveling to Israel and laying out under the stars in the Negev, maybe a, maybe a spot where Abraham once sat and looked and stars is shockingly beautiful, the number of stars in the world. The past couple weeks, my family and I were blessed to spend a lot of time at Lake Michigan, where my parents have a lake home. You know what? No matter how hard you try, when you come up from the beach, there's sand everywhere. Everywhere. Even after using the garden hose and then the outdoor shower, maybe sitting in the hot tub a little bit, Kids still have sand in their ears and in their hair, between their toes and in their suits. In fact, yesterday I was doing some folding of laundry, surely socks that had been at the lake, and when I turned them right side out, what landed all over the family room floor? Sand. It's everywhere. That's a lot of sand. Grains too innumerable to count. And by faith, in the faithful God who promised Abe and Sarah a baby, they received the gift of an innumerable number of descendants. This figurative language is meant to say that faith in the seemingly impossible results in miraculous yields. Right? Faith in the seemingly impossible promises of our faithful God yields miraculous results. And you know what's more impossible than Abe and Sarah having a miracle baby and lots and lots and lots of descendants? You know what's more impossible than that? That a holy God, perfectly righteous in every way, would extend forgiveness and eternal life to rebel sinners like us. It's impossible. You can't make that promise. And yet our trustworthy and faithful God promises just that. That's the gospel. That's the good news. The promise that all those, but only those, who put their faith in Abraham's perfect descendant, Jesus Christ, the one who died on the cross and rose victorious from the grave, who sits right now at the right hand of the Father, those who put faith in Him alone, will receive forgiveness and eternal life. If you haven't trusted Jesus yet, if you haven't submitted your life to Him, 
If you haven't surrendered everything to say, save me, be my master, my Lord, would you trust him today? It's a big promise that God extends, but he's worthy of your trust. And for those of us who have already trusted Jesus, may we continue to live by active faith as sojourners in this world, awaiting our eternal home with Jesus, who is our only hope in life and death. Would you pray for me? Oh, Lord God, thank you for speaking to us. Thank you for speaking your commands. Thank you for giving us examples like Abraham and Sarah. Thank you for speaking your promises to us. Now grant us faith to believe, to trust you, and live lives of active faith. And you alone pray in Jesus' name.